Hello, everyone, and welcome uh, to today's webinar. My name is Aros Velas May, and I'm a technical advisor for the IBP uh, network. Let me put this on presentation mode. Um, today's webinar is titled uh, WSHO IVP Implementation Stories. Um, and today is our global launch, the first of a number of webinars that will um, uh, be focusing on the implementation stories of WSHO guidelines and high impact practices in family planning. We're very glad you were able to join us today. Um, this is a, um, uh, at a glance, the stories that, that we'll be talking about today. Um, as you can see, we have stories from a number of countries from all over the world. And when I see this list and I see the, the representation of, um, of our partners here, it makes me think of the convergence of the three strategic objectives of IVP, which are the dissemination of WSO guidelines and high impact practices, our um, documentation of these practices of what works in family planning, as well as um, um, the building of partnership and um, knowledge sharing that we are have been invested on for the past 20 years. Um, this is our agenda. Uh, we'll have uh, Dr. Chiare from WSO uh, share some reflections on what it means, um, what this innovation from IBP means for WSO and our partners. Um, we also have our partner in this initiative, which is Knowledge Success, Sarah Harlan, talk about the process, the creation and the dissemination plans. And then uh, we'll have Dr. Tate um, from the WHO IVP network um, share some reflections about, um, about this work. Our last presenter um, is Jeannie Graney from uh, UNFPA, who is also part of the co-sponsors team of the High Impact Practices uh, Partnership. So Jeannie will um, round the, the uh, presentations with uh, the reflections on how to use um, these implementation stories um, in the field. Um, before we begin, uh, I just want to remind everyone that the webinar will be recorded, that you can um, read the, the stories uh, following that link that you see on the screen. I put a number of uh, handouts as well on the, on the handout sec section of the webinar control panel, including a PDF of the entire presentation should you want to follow along um, with that. Um, a, a quick reminder that you can send us a question or a comment anytime during the presentation. Instead of leaving time at the end of, the, of everyone's uh, presentations, we'll do a question after each presenter. So with, all, with that, uh, thank you again for joining us and um, um, send away the questions. Uh, these are our presenters and um, I'll turn it over to James. James. Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, Ados and uh, colleagues. And uh, I'm really glad that this opportunity to join this webinar. Uh, on these implementation stories. I think the implementation stories, in many ways, as others have said, reflect all the aspects of uh, what IBP uh, aims to achieve. And for us in WHO, IBP is actually an invaluable resource and partner that we have worked with uh, since uh, its inception in 20, 2000. And our main focus has been the process of dissemination and supporting implementation of WHO guidelines and also the high impact uh, practices. I must acknowledge that IBP is actually one of the pioneers in uh, SRH knowledge management. And over time, it has evolved over the years into a premier SRH network and resource. And not only for sharing guidelines and practices, but also for providing a neutral platform in which uh, we can engage 
and uh, engage local partners, uh, both to inform implementation and also to prioritize uh, research. And I think these stories really add uh, another level to this uh, process of what uh, IBP can uh, contribute in this area. In terms of networks, I think it is networks like IBP uh, that WHO uh, can hear from partners on which, where, when, and how our guidelines and tools and other resources are being used or not being used. Uh, these engagements are very important for us because they inform priority areas that we as WHO should be addressing. And I really look forward to future engagements in this space for us to be able to uh, course correct uh, in terms of our guidelines and other areas that we should be addressing. Uh, importantly, in its transformation agenda, uh, WHO has uh, prioritized increased focus on country impact, working with WHO country offices, our regional offices, uh, the ministries of health, and also with the local partners. And really, it is in this context that we should view these stories as documenting both the impact at country level, because all of them are drawn from things that we have done at country level, and this is where for WHO going forward, we are really looking to see what is our impact uh, there. I must uh, acknowledge that these uh, implementation stories are a very creative and unique effort to document and communicate our implementation experiences uh, using a storyteller approach. Uh, this is an innovative uh, approach, and I think it's the first of its kind. Uh, for us here at WHO. And just from initial uh, kind of uptake, just uh, to highlight how important this is, uh, we are already seeing interest in replicating uh, this effort from other units uh, to use this approach, for example, to document uh, integration office efforts, to document uh, capacity building efforts in research, and so on. So we are already seeing uptake of this approach within uh, our department. And uh, to close, I must say that I'm very excited to be part of this important work and really look forward to reading and hearing more about the stories uh, from the others and uh, in the coming months. But as we launch these stories today, I look forward to joining subsequent sessions. I would like to congratulate all the others for this great effort and appreciate the high quality of their inputs. And also to acknowledge uh, the effort that the Secretariat of IBP, uh, Nandita and Ados uh, have put, and also the IBP uh, leadership uh, across uh, have really put to bring these uh, partners together and to deliver such a great uh, product. So thank you very much, and I really look forward to the presentations. And over back to you, Ados. Thank you so much, James. Uh, thanks so much for those remarks and uh, for uh, thanking our partners. Um, uh, again, I've, uh, I want to congratulate all uh, the winning stories and amazing effort of all the partners, of IVP partners across the world um, in putting together these stories. James, uh, before you go, I wanted to ask you a question. The, um, you mentioned uh, during your remarks that the efforts, uh, this effort, this IBP innovation um, could be replicated uh, in other units at WSO. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about how that, um, how that process would, would uh, move forward and what would be some of the lessons learned uh, in replicating uh, such uh, initiative? So I think uh, there are several, uh, maybe first to address how will this happen? What, what is the exact uh, pickup that we have seen from colleagues that have looked at this uh, innovative approach? 
So we have colleagues who have been working in the, in the space of universal health uh, coverage. As uh, most of you know, this is actually uh, a pillar for WHO, is looking at health more holistically and uh, in terms of universal health uh, coverage. And uh, there are proposals to actually use this approach to document uh, efforts that have happened in terms of uh, bringing sexual reproductive health into the fold of universal health uh, coverage. How is it being done? What exactly that is, is happening? Uh, in terms of the storytelling approach, one of the opportunities that it provides us is this opportunity to hear in more detail exactly what happened and to see examples and to present it in an interesting way that can connect uh, with our readers. Definitely, the stories are much more than just collecting a lot of data that we used five guidelines, they were used by 30% of the cases. I think that uh, does not resonate well with uh, the way people communicate. So this, I think, is an important lesson. And I think as we disseminate uh, these stories, it's some learnings that we'll have to do of how we can uh, leverage this. Uh, the other issue is maybe some of our internal learnings is just to make sure that uh, we are more purposeful to from the beginning to have these stories as a WHO products or as a product that uh, are planned so that we can kind of give them some of the the I don't say legitimacy but some of the weight of uh, the organizations that are producing them. So I think uh, we know that within IPP we have uh, UNFPA, we have WHO, we have USAID, we have all these uh, co-conveners. But I think if uh, as we move forward we can make sure that in that process of development we buy in this organization so that the product can have that weight of the organization behind it. I think we'll give them more uh, credibility and more buy-in and these organizations will also help us to distribute. So maybe that's uh, some of the lessons, but I think as uh, innovators and as the first uh, uh, group kind of off the blocks, uh, we, we will learn and we'll see what others are adopting. And I think we'll always be ahead of the curve in terms of this uh, approach. Over to you, Andrews. Thank you so much, James. That's uh, That was um, uh, really, really useful. And um, uh, thank you for all your support um, uh, in, to IBP in putting together uh, this work and in our uh, to our work in general. Um, now I have uh, the pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Sarah Har Harlan, who is um, the partnerships uh, lead at Knowledge Success, um, our partner in putting together uh, these stories. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you so much, Ados. Just turning on my webcam and welcome everyone. Thank you so much to Ados and to James for those great remarks. Um, I'm Sarah Harlan with the Johns Hopkins Center for Communication Programs, and I'm the partnerships team lead, as Ados mentioned, for the Knowledge Success Project funded by USAID. And I'm going to be talking to you all today about the process, the story creation, and the dissemination for the IBP implementation stories. And Knowledge Success has been really excited to be partnering with IBP and WHO to launch this story collection to help us better understand the real life experiences that those of us have implementing high impact practices and WHO guidelines. So I'll first talk about the selection process. You can go to the next slide. Okay. Um, so we started soliciting stories um, for this activity in mid-January of 2020. Um, we put out a call in English, Spanish, and French. 
um, and the submission deadline was February 14th of 2020. Um, so folks had roughly a month to submit a short two-page expression of interest for this activity. And to our great delight, we received 110 submissions. There were 89 in English, 10 in Spanish, and 11 in French. You can go to the next slide, please. So we had a panel of IVP steering committee members um, representing UNFPA, FHI 360, CCP, WHO, and Gender Health, um, JPIGO, MSH, Pathfinder, and USAID. We also included the core IVP secretariat in the selection process, um, as well as a couple of us from Knowledge Success. And each submission was reviewed by two different members of the subcommittee, and we avoided conflicts of interest by ensuring that folks were not reviewing submissions from their own organization. And we removed any identifying personal details from the submissions as well. Um, and we reviewed the stories on our own um, individually using a scoring sheet. And then we met and discussed as a group and we made our final selections in April of 2020. And we notified the winners in May of 2020 and we made sure that they were available and willing to participate. Um, they each received a stipend from WHO to write their stories. And then we announced the winners to the larger family planning community in June of 2020. Um, and I will say that it was not easy to narrow this down. Um, we were initially only going to publish about three to five stories, but we increased it to 15 because we had so many great submissions. And so we ended up selecting 12 in English, two in Spanish, and one in French. And you can go to the next slide. Um, so we selected stories based on a number of criteria. We were looking for interesting and unique stories that had a clear voice. Um, we were also interested in programs that had a diversity of partners, so those working with governments, international NGOs, grassroots organizations, working with various donors. Um, we were also looking for a clear description of the problem, challenges, and intervention. Um, and we wanted to see some evidence of impact. So either qualitative or quantitative or both. Um, we wanted some data um, showing that this um, intervention had been um, successful. And since the purpose of the stories really was to share real life examples, we were looking for authors who could clearly articulate their lessons learned and who had some unique experiences implementing high impact practices and or WHO guidelines. And we also wanted our uh, story collection to represent a range of geographic regions and partners, et cetera. So you can go to the next slide, please. Um, and so in the end, we ended up with 15 stories that represent a range of experiences, topic areas, geographies, partners, and different HIPs and guidelines. Um, the story collection includes about 10 different HIPs um, and a number of different WHO guidelines as well. So um, now we'd like to acknowledge all of the authors and organizations who were selected. Um, they're really the heart of this activity and we're so excited to have all of these stories completed. It's really a fantastic collection and it's very diverse with 15 unique experiences highlighted. So if you go to the next slide, um, here's about half of the winning stories. Um, these are listed in alphabetical order by organization and this is the first slide of two. Um, this list will be available after the webinar. Um, I believe this, these slides will be available um, for those who would like to look at it in more detail. Um, and you can go to the next slide for the second half. Um, so the stories uh, come from Colombia, Benin, um, Nigeria, Tanzania, Ecuador, Bangladesh, Uganda, Burkina Faso, Vietnam, Mexico, Madagascar, India, Zimbabwe, Kenya, and Guatemala. Um, so congratulations to all the authors. Um, and so next, um, if you go to the next slide, I just want to talk a little bit about the story creation process. Um, so after announcing the winners and sharing the list with our larger community, we worked with authors to support them to, as they documented their story. So we held calls, we um, worked with them to draft the stories in June of 2020. Um, and you know, working closely with the authors, uh, we helped review, work on layout, layout, layouts, excuse me, editing, et cetera. 
Um, and the final stories are now available as PDFs, so you can look at all of them at your leisure. Dissemination and follow-up, just a little bit about this. Um, we're currently disseminating these stories via the IBP website, um, promoting widely on social media, and we ask that you share them with your networks as well. Um, and we are looking for ways to tell more stories about program implementation. So as James mentioned, this is a new activity. Um, I know it's new for WHO and IBP. It's also new for Knowledge Success to collect this, this level of detail about program implementation for HIPS and WHO guidelines. And so we're really wanting others to learn from this. If you have recommendations for other formats, creative formats um, that might work for the way that you as an individual learn, because I know we all have different learning styles, um, please let us know. Um, we're really interested in, in hearing from you. Um, so next slide. Um, I'd like to just extend a special thanks to all the authors and partners and organizations who worked on these stories. We would love to hear from you, as I mentioned, if you have additional ideas um, or ideas for disseminating them, or if you have any questions or comments. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, that was um, that was a great uh, outline of the the process, and you made it uh, look so easy. Though it, it took a lot of hours from your team and hours and our steering committee and everyone involved uh, uh, to make this a reality. So uh, thank you so much for that. Um, now I'd like us to take a, a minute uh, to do a poll. Um, so I'll go ahead and launch that right now. Um, and um, the poll is how many implementation stories, stories sorry, won the competition? Uh, please select one. Um, and I'll give the audience, our participants, uh, about 30 seconds to respond. While uh, many of you are, are doing this, I uh, want to thank the 128 people who are joining us today from all over the world. Uh, thank you so much for, for jo joining this webinar. Um, and we hope that you can join uh, future ones when we go into more detail uh, on each of the stories um, by region. A bit more detail about that uh, at the end of the webinar. So we are getting close to most people responding. I'll go ahead and close the, uh, the poll now. Thank you so much for, uh, for your responses. And uh, a, a vast majority of you uh, uh, provided the, the right answer. 15 stories uh, were the ones that were selected for uh, for this uh, activity. Thank you. And with that, I'll, um, we'll move to the next presentation, um, which is going to be uh, Nandita Tate, who leads the WSO IBP network. Over to you, Nandita. Great. Thank you, Ados. And thank you, James and Sarah, for your presentations. And thank you all for attending. Since the stories are just published today, uh, many of you probably haven't read them yet. So what I thought I would do is give some reflections on behalf of IBP on what we observed in the stories, some key themes, some lessons learned. Next. So as, as you know, the purpose of the stories was really to try and document how WHO guidelines and high impact practices were being used to support family planning programming at country levels. Um, what we noticed was that throughout the stories, a lot, a lot of the interventions focused on some of the service delivery, high impact interventions, mobile outreach, community health workers, family planning integration with postpartum immunization and drug shops and pharmacies. However, there were many that also touched on some of the other high impact practices related to uh, the enabling environment or social behavior change. So things like community group engagement, supportive policies, domestic financing, et cetera. With regards to WHO guidelines, there were many, oftentimes the stories mentioned using the WHO MEC or the medical eligibility criteria and the wheel, um, as well as the family planning handbook and training resource package. These were very commonly mentioned tools and used mostly for training and to support clinical practice. 
But there was other WHO guidance that was also mentioned, things like uh, some of the newer guidelines, like ensuring human rights in the provision of contraception, um, and some of the WHO guidelines for adolescent health. Next. So in terms of key themes and lessons learned, um, I, I pulled out five here because I think, I think they were sort of resonated with me and seemed to be the most important. Um, you know, the, the first one is really understanding that high impact practices or these interventions are not implemented in isolation. So in many stories, while the focus was on outlining how one particular intervention was being implemented, we noticed that they were often combined with others as part of a package of interventions. So for example, the story from Tanzania highlighted mobile outreach for family planning, but it linked that outreach program to existing services for HIV and TB screening, immunization, and ARV refill days. So while the focus was on mobile outreach, there, there were very strong links to integration with immunization programs, as an example. The other thing, another lesson we learned was that there are other best practices, as we can call them, that are critical to successful implementation that aren't necessarily what we would call evidence-based interventions in the way we think about them typically. Um, and yet they're so important to making the program work. So for example, in the story from Nigeria, as part of the immediate postpartum family planning intervention, they also incorporated a very detailed and robust mentoring program um, for providers that helps support continued training, capacity building, and sustainability. And this was a really core part of that intervention and really contributed to the success of the intervention and also the sustainability of that intervention. And there were a lot of practices like these that were reflected throughout the stories. Third, we realized that it was very important to link WHO guidelines and high impact practices, and these linkages can really help support quality programming. Um, and we hear this time and time again through our work at IBP that people are very familiar and have high recognition and value for WHO guidelines, but they program around interventions. Um, so how do we better link the two together? And we saw much of this in the stories. So for example, there was a story from Burkina Faso where as part of their immediate postpartum family planning intervention, pre-service training was provided using the WHO MEC wheel and criteria. And new graduates were then actually given a copy of the WHO handbook for family planning providers. And so it was really well linked. Uh, the intervention was well linked with WHO guidelines to really provide a very high quality intervention. Another lesson that we learned and as we read throughout the, through the stories is that family planning programming is intersectoral. And I know this is one of the buzzwords these days, but it really was evident as we read these stories from the diversity of countries that in almost every story, there was a link between the family planning or health intervention to other aspects of community development, whether it was linking to economic growth, education, community empowerment, government advocacy, or even climate change. And I think this is really important to note as we think about how we program in family planning moving forward. And finally, funding and technical support, which we provided, can offer capacity exchange in documenting field experiences. And this is something that we really want to stress because we, we feel that enabling our partners with both funding and the technical support to share their stories in their own voices, not only enabled a fun and dynamic way to share experiences, but also provided an opportunity to strengthen capacity around documentation. And it also helped build a community. Um, and I say capacity exchange because there was an element of sort of helping to document, um, but there was a very strong element on our side in sort of learning what documentation means, what resources are needed, what gaps are in terms of use of WHO guidelines and high impact practices. And that exchange was really, really important. Next. Um, I wanted to spend another minute on this capacity strengthening piece because I think it's a very um, interesting and sort of unexpected benefit of this activity. 
Um, and you can see a quote there from one of our authors that, you know, it has been quite a learning experience to do this. So you can say that capacity building is an additional outcome of the support that has been provided. Um, so just a few points on this, you know, documentation is challenging and we're, we're always saying, well, we need to document what's happening in the field. And it's really easy to ask partners to document their experiences, but doing so is quite a challenge. It's not that simple. It requires time. It requires resources. It requires effort. Um, a lot of times documentation means complex case studies or requirements for lots of data um, and to show impact. And that can be quite difficult for, for partners to take on, especially when there's no funding provided. So we really try to, to, to fill that gap by providing some funding support. Um, Another interesting piece related to this is that creative storytelling approaches can invite diverse perspectives. And you know we've been hearing a lot about diversity, equity, and inclusion these days. Um, and it is very important. And if, we, if we're serious about wanting to hear those perspectives, we need to provide opportunities to get them. And that means different approaches to hearing a story, whether it's storytelling like we use or other creative forms to hear what's happening on the ground. Um, another piece that we wanted to stress is this idea of providing structure and feedback, but not prescription. And so this really, we really tried to make an effort to make sure that we provided some guidance, but weren't too directive or too prescriptive. Um, and so this actually forced us to also learn about what can be documented. Sometimes what we want to hear isn't always possible, or sometimes what was documented isn't necessarily what we expected. Um, and that was an important lesson for us to learn as well. Keeping the narrative and the photos authentic. And while we tried to provide feedback on the structure of the story a little bit, we, we really tried to keep the voices as they were. Um, and this was true with the photos too. We used photos that were submitted by the authors themselves and really didn't wanna change that piece of the story either. And finally, we say learn and build a community. So we had regular calls with our authors to update on the process, provide feedback, and this helped us form a little community. Uh, we found there was a lot of sharing between us and them, but also among each other, um, which was really great. Um, and we hope that, that community will continue. For IBP, it also meant we were able to welcome some new partners into our network. Um, as you saw from the list that Sarah shared, a lot of these partners that submitted stories are partners that we had also never worked with before. And that was, that was great to start working with them. And we hope to continue working with them in the future. Next. So I just want to close with um, some feedback that we heard from our authors about the process. It was a long process. There were a number of additional reviews involved, um, but overall the process seemed to be very well received and the, the, the approach very well received. And so we are very grateful again to our authors for their hard work and sharing their stories and implementation experiences. So I'll take you, I'll let you take a look. And with that, I will end. Thanks. Thank you, Landita, for, for that presentation and uh, for sharing some of the lessons um, learned during this process. Um, I have a question for you. Um, you mentioned that um, one, of the, um, uh, one of the challenges, and, and this is a challenge in our field, um, and it has been with us for a very long time, is documentation. Um, and you mentioned a couple of things like funding, like uh, investing in capacity, strengthening to to develop um, that skill of documentation. Um, is there any other recommendations around um, around that to strengthen documentation in the field? Well, um, there, there's a lot. Um, I, I will say I think we need to be creative and be open-minded about what documentation looks like. Because I think, you know, for us, and I have a research background, and I think many of us really like data and case studies and really, 
you know, detailed manuscripts that will show if I do A, I get B, um, and therefore there's impact. And what, what I think we're learning is that there are different ways to document that can be equally informative if we really want to understand what's happening on the ground. And I think this was just one approach. It was a very informal storytelling approach. Um, as Sarah mentioned, and you'll see as you read the story, some of them are very data heavy, which is great. Um, some of them are more qualitative heavy, and some of them are just highlighting some experiences, um, some of the challenges that people faced. So there, there's really quite a range of the kind of information that you'll find in these stories. And I think being open to what documentation means and allowing our colleagues who are working on the ground to help us and, and inform us about what documentation means is really important, especially if we want the information from these stories to get used. And I think what we found really interesting is because this is a format that was fairly, um, it, it's easy to digest and easy to use. We, we know our authors are equally excited to read each other's stories and learn from each other as they are in contributing their own. So I'll say that, thanks. Thank you. Um, this is a question for Sarah and for you, Nandita. So if you could stay um, uh, for one more second. Um, um, are there any plans to, to replicate this innovation, this, the implementation stories in the future? And if so, um, what, um, what would the process uh, look like? Would it be the same as, as the 2020 um, process or will there be any, any differences? That's a great question. Maybe I can take it and then hand it to sure. you, Nandita. Um, so, I mean, as, as you probably saw, this was quite a lengthy process um, in terms of collecting the different stories. Um, we had only intended to, to publish a few. We ended up publishing a lot more than, than we had originally thought. Um, so, I mean, we, we may end up doing something like this again. We would love to hear feedback from all of you to see, you know, what you think of this collection. We're also interested, though, in looking at other formats, so other media, whether it's audio or video or stories that folks submit um, in other ways. Um, so, I mean, in Knowledge Success, um, we look to serve a lot of different learning styles, so to meet the needs of folks who learn in different ways, um, whether that's looking at a lot of data or whether that's something that's very visual um, or audio. Um, I myself am a big podcast listener, so anything that could be an audio format, that's what I usually gravitate towards. So everyone is different, and, and we do want to collect these stories moving forward. What that looks like is a little bit unclear at this point. Maybe Nandita, you, mm -hmm. you might have more to say on that. Great. Thanks, Sarah. I, I think um, I agree. I mean, I think we, we've learned, certainly learned a lot about this process. Um, through this experience. I think, as you heard James mention, there is a lot of interest in using this approach, at least through WHO, at least in our department, to sort of get some more of these implementation experiences. And so I do think there is some interest in replicating this, um, whether that's through, through us again or through colleagues. I think a couple of things, as Sarah mentioned, you know, being very open into what that documentation looks like is something that we would be interested in exploring. So for example, you know, this focused on a series of written stories, a collection of written stories, but it would be really interesting to see and hear from authors or others on the ground, are there different ways to document that would be of interest? Um, and we would certainly be open to that. Um, the other piece is, as I mentioned, it requires resources and I think, I, I want to stress it because I think we really emphasize that part of this process that we didn't just ask, you know, hey, submit this and this is of interest and it'll get you some visibility. That, of course, was true, but we also provided some resources so that authors and partners could go out to the field, collect stories, take pictures. I think some of our authors have plans to use some of that funding to then disseminate further in country. And I think we can't underestimate the importance of providing financial resources in, in, in getting this kind of information. Thanks. 
Great. Thank you both for, for those answers. They're fantastic. And, um, and I hope that our audience who are with us today, our participants, um, are, are getting some ideas. And please do share those ideas with, with us through the chat or by email uh, as we look uh, at other ways to, um, uh, to move forward uh, with documenting implementation stories from the field. And with that, um, thank you, Nandita. Thank you, Sarah, for for again for for your presentations and your your answers. Um, we'll move to another poll. So uh, let me launch that right now. And I believe this was uh, briefly mentioned here. So if you, uh, during one of the presentations, if, if that wasn't uh, the case, uh, please take your best guess um, and um, uh, send us your answers. Um, we'll take a couple of, uh, about 20 seconds to, uh, to collect your answers. And thank you all for your feedback on, on the chat about um, how interesting this is and how useful this information, this webinar has been. Uh, that's very appreciated. So please keep sending your answers. Excellent. Um, thank you so much for, for answering the poll. Um, I'll just go ahead and share the, the results. Um, we are very lucky today to have such, a, uh, uh, such an audience, a, a, a group of participants who are paying attention. Thank you so much. Um, yes, the answer is all of the above. Um, the stories were um, uh, submitted in French, English, and Spanish. As you would imagine, we had to create a number of tools, announcements, and um, um, uh, other resources in the three languages to make sure that we had um, that we were capturing and reaching out uh, a diverse audience, not only in geographies but also in language. So um, thank you so much uh, for that. And with that, I'll uh, like to move to our. Um, next presenter, who is Jeannie Greeny from uh, UNFPA. Jeannie, over to you. Thank you, Ados, and uh, good afternoon, good morning to everyone. Um, and I really just want to echo, firstly, uh, a huge thank you to all of the authors who submitted and everybody who submitted an implementation story. They are fantastic. I was diving into them because I was lucky enough to get a little advanced access to them. And it's so useful to read about the on the ground examples of how guidance is being applied. And um, it's I've also saw some of the initial submissions and it's been so interesting to see how they've evolved and the kind of detail and the format that they've come up with. Um, and, you know, I realize, especially at the moment in the last year, it's been difficult to find the time to and it's always difficult to find the time and energy to document what you're doing while still having to deliver in some pretty difficult circumstances. Um, and I think, of course, this underlines, as, as Nandita was mentioning, the continued need for technical and financial support to do this. Um, so they've been, and they're also incredibly inspiring. I must admit, I, um, as I was saying to colleagues this morning, when I opened them, I started to get lost inside them and say, oh, this is exactly the kind of detail, just at the right level of detail of knowing you know, what worked, but also some of the challenges as were faced. So I really encourage everybody to, to look through those. And it's also fantastic to have them in, in multiple languages as well. Um, I'm the last of today's presenters, so I thought it would be useful to have a think through how these stories such as these, the implementation stories, fit in with some of the other knowledge sharing tools that we have and approaches, and also a little bit about how UNFPA can fit into that space and the role that we can play in sharing these stories. And then finally, I'll share with you a couple of opportunities um, where you can share your experiences and, and contribute not your knowledge about what's working on the ground. Next slide, please, Alice. So as James mentioned, uh, UNFPA is one of the core conveners of the IBP network and we're hugely proud to be part of that and, and value the platform so much as one of the ways that we connect with partners, not only for sharing evidence, but also to hear back from you on what's working and, and what's not in implementing SRHR programs. 
I know that most of you already know what UNFPA is about, so I won't dwell on this on this slide. But really just to highlight that we set ourselves as an organization and as many of you saw at the ICBD25 summit, that we're really pushing towards three transformative results in support of Agenda 2030. Ending unmet need for family planning, ending preventable maternal mortality and ending harmful practices and that's including gender-based violence and of course we know that none of this can be achieved in the time we have remaining to 2030 without partnerships and especially the meaningful and participation and engagement of all of those who are involved not just in programming but also those that the programs aim to reach especially the most underserved including youth and adolescents people with disabilities those facing humanitarian and fragile contexts and all marginalized populations. Um, and before I just jump onto the next slide, I wanted to make a shameless plug for the uh, 2021 State of the World Population. That's that image comes from that, uh, the cover of that uh, report that was launched last week that focuses on bodily autonomy and SRHR, in case you've not yet seen it. Um, and I think it's, it's so important in this context because it speaks about why it's essential that voices are heard, choices are available, and that everyone has their right to bodily autonomy upheld. And throughout that report, there are some really powerful stories from partners across the globe. So I, just as an aside, I recommend that to you, um, as well as the implementation stories we're speaking about today. Uh, next slide, please. So UNFPA has, um, is working in around 150 countries and we have offices on the ground in those. And we are working with hundreds of partners, with all of you, um, as well as the governments, INGOs, private sector. We work right down to community level. So I think we have an interesting space where we're fitting in, in terms of implementation of SRHR. So we're working with the norms and standards that we provide inputs into that WHO produces, but how we can also get that information out to partners on the ground. And I was so pleased as I was looking at the implementation stories, I can really see that some of these, just even a handful of them that I was able to dive into already, we're working with Japaigo on postpartum family planning in Benin, for example, and with IRC supporting Rohingya women in Bangladesh, just as the first few that came through. And I think this is one of the ways that we can sort of think about how UNFPA's role is, in, is working with partnerships and how we as an organization are really learning how to support dynamic and inclusive partnerships. It's definitely a process and we'd love to hear through IBP network how that's working and where we can really bring forward your added value as partners, especially for reaching underserved populations. Before I jump on to the tools we use, I just wanted to outline some of the approaches we have to partnerships and how you can engage with us so we can think about how those knowledge sharing tools work and where implementation stories fit. So as a bedrock for all of our activities, of course, we are underpinning everything with a human rights approach, aiming for culturally sensitive approaches and meaningful participation of those actually impacted by programs, especially family planning clients, those who are underserved, and of course, all of the gatekeepers that we see who influence women's and girls' ability to access sexual and reproductive health. And you'll see this in many of our strategies. So we have, our, for example, our youth strategy, uh, my body, my life, my world, putting young people at the center of sustainable development. And we have strategies as well, of course, with engaging with people with disabilities, helping them to make informed choices about their bodies and their lives. And uh, we have a great commitment to supporting innovation, particularly looking for innovation that can be scaled up and how we can support those approaches. And of course, our huge role in convening South-South cooperation and triangular cooperation partnerships. So we can really think about how we're documenting success in the area of sexual and reproductive health and rights, gender equality and population and development and making opportunities for partners to share what's working across countries and across contexts. And of course, as many of you are also working in this space, the humanitarian development continuum, as of course those facing crises, numbers are increasing, but also not just ensuring they have access as they face a fragile and humanitarian context, but also helping the strengthening health systems in the recovery phase. So, um, Ados, if you can jump to the next slide, thinking about how all of these partnership approaches are and, and how we roll these out, what are the suite of tools that we're using to engage and where do implementation stories fit and how can they add value? 
So you'll see um, all of the different tools that we have in terms of how we're engaging with partners, how we're collecting evidence and how, and this isn't just UNFPA, some of these are multi-partner initiatives. So of course we have the WHO guidance and, and the implementation guides. Um, we also of course have the high impact practices in family planning, which I think many of you are involved in or know. And these are um, evidence-based criteria vetted by experts against specific criteria and documented in easy to use formats. And they help us program and focus resources for greatest impact. UNFPA is very dedicated to collecting best practices and evaluating those as well as country case studies. We're also supporting dialogue and advocacy with many of you engaged in that process across private and public sector, faith-based organizations, civil society, with policymakers, with donors. And then of course we have our data and the analysis that we have, not just from census, but also from our work on the SDG5 target, for example, which really help us identify where there are gaps and where we can focus our interventions. And of course, and last but not least, we also have independent evaluations that we conduct on themes, really looking into areas, for example, like family planning, is that working? Where can we add value and impact as an organization? So I think that the implementation stories really have a central role and if you like, they could be considered um, an additional weapon in the arsenal of tools that we have for really driving progress in SRHR. And I think they can really, these implementation stories when they're well developed like they have been through these IBP process and with the support from K for Success, when they're done well like this, I really think that they can have an added value of improving the other tools but also thinking about how we can, as, as Nandita said, capture some of the perspective of what's happening on the ground. So I really do think these bring an added value to all of these tools and, and can contribute to them all. And they help us identify you know, what's critical in terms of scaling up impact um, and what's good, you know, where the interventions are uh, most efficient and how local ownership and capacities um, of all of the actors from across sectors can be brought together. So these are fantastic um, way of um, being able to augment what we already have. And I think from UNFPA side, I really look forward to sharing the 15 stories that went across um, not only UNFPA, but also in all of the partnership approaches that I've outlined um, and really thinking about how we can learn from their insights. And of course, um, as Sarah mentioned as well, it would be great to learn how you as IBP partners are sharing these approaches, how you're using the implementation stories in, in what you're doing. Um, and we'd love to hear more from you on this. Um, so I hope that these were just some ideas of how they can fit in with other products and how you might use them, but really want to learn from you what, what's working and how we can use them. And I hope we will be able to continue supporting these approaches and learning how implementation stories um, really influence the work that we're doing. And then, um, Eros, for the last slide, I just wanted to highlight with you a couple of opportunities um, that we'd love to engage with you as IBP partners on. I think many of you know already the high impact practices, um, but what you may not know is that you now have an opportunity to engage with those and to provide inputs and feedback on the development of briefs that have been produced recently. And you can use that, you can go to the HIPS website and think about, and you can engage there. You can also sign up to be members of technical expert working groups providing, because what we really want to do is make sure that those briefs are valid for what's happening on the ground and how we can learn from your stories and implementation to improve those briefs. So please do go there. And then the other opportunity we have is many of you I know are already engaged in um, international conference on family planning, where there is a new subcommittee for the upcoming ICFP, which although the physical meeting won't be held until November 2022, we have a number of virtual events happening. Uh, we'll be, there'll be regional workshops and there's now an ICFP implementation subcommittee. You can go to that page um, and keep um, posted on our upcoming opportunities. There'll be workshops where you can also share your stories of implementation. Um, and of course, we'll be working alongside the IBP network in, in developing what the different um, sessions for the ICFP website. I hope this was um, a little useful and just some of my thoughts on how we can really bring out these examples of effective local action and make use of them. Thank you and back to you, Ados. Thank you so much, uh, Jenny. Uh, that was very, very helpful. Um, and before you go, um, 
I wanted to ask you a question. Um, you mentioned um, ICFP, um, and a member of our audience uh, mentioned that um, they came across for the first time, uh, they came across the HIPS at ICFP in Rwanda. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if, um, if, you, if you think of any other um, outlets or any other opportunities, whether in person or virtual, uh, where the stories um, can be shared, as well as the tools, including the WHO guidelines. Yeah, thanks, Eros, and it was great to learn that um, the ICFP is a useful way for also sharing the high impact practices. And I know that the IBP network colleagues were, um, usually have, and I'm sure we will do when we get to the to the the in person meeting. Uh, there's usually an IBP booth where you can learn more about the various tools, and I'm I'm sure we will be showcasing the implementation stories there. Um, one of the good ways to engage with the high impact practices is to, if you go to that HIPS website, which is uh, listed here, um, there are webinars as well um, that you can join um, that are held and hosted through IBP that tell you more about the, the various high impact practices. Um, and as I mentioned, you can certainly now go in and you can look at the briefs and you'll see which ones are open for your comment and inputs. We really, really want to engage more strongly with partners on the ground on, on what's working and also what's not. You can be very frank there as well. And of course, as we redevelop the briefs and think about how we're using them, uh, really encourage partners to sign up to be part of technical expert working groups and engage them. Thanks. Thank you, Jenny. And, um, and that reminds me um, that um, while the HIPS started about 10 years ago, they have definitely evolved into a much stronger tool because of the feedback and the participation of our colleagues in the field. Uh, all of you who are implementing, who are running programs, have uh, a wealth of information and knowledge that, uh, that definitely uh, can improve not only these tools, but also all the, the other global guidelines that are produced by entities like WHO and other donors. So thank you. Um, I just wanted to, uh, before we, uh, we close, to let you know that we will have uh, a number of uh, webinars uh, that will be regional, um, and we have grouped a number of our, um, our stories by region and by language, so that we uh, are able to disseminate uh, these amazing stories uh, of implementation to a wider audience. So stay tuned. Uh, since you sign up for this webinar, um, you will receive an invitation for the upcoming events, um, and, uh, and we hope to see you there. We are almost at time, but I wanted to give uh, the floor to Sarah uh, to give us a couple of words before uh, we close and then turn it over to Nandita to, to close the webinar. And before I do that, I want to uh, thank you all, all the presenters, the, the writers of the implementation stories, and our audience for um, having the opportunity to, to host you today for this webinar. Thank you. Thanks, Addison. and thank you so much to all of you for joining us. Um, since Knowledge Success began more than two years ago, we've been hearing from our FPRH colleagues around the world about this need to um, talk, tell real life stories about what works and what doesn't work in family planning. And at the same time, we've heard from IBP partners about this need to document real life examples of programs implementing high impact practices and WHO guidelines. Um, so we're really excited about this initiative to um, conquer both of these challenges and needs, and we're so pleased with not only the number of applicants to this competition, but with the quality of applicants and with the selected stories. Um, so this really speaks to the fact that the stories are out there, there's a demand for it, and so, you know, happy reading. We wish you um, the best as you read through these, and please disseminate with your networks, and we see this as just the beginning of this process of sharing and learning. Um, so thanks so much to IBP and WHO for this great partnership, and to Jenny for her remarks as well. Over to Nandita.
Great, thank you, Sarah. And I'll just close by saying thank you again to all of our participants on the line, um, and a special thank you to all of our authors, um, because I think I see many of you on the line, they've joined us today. So we applaud you, we applaud your effort, and really appreciate you taking the time to share your stories with us. Um, do join us for the subsequent webinars where we will hear from our authors directly about uh, their implementation experiences on the ground. Thank you all again, and we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Bye-bye.